Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John. This is Many a True Nerd, and welcome back to Rome. Total War. It has returned as the ancient scrolls foretold. Oh, it is good to be back with Rome Total War on the channel. Welcome to your new strategy series for Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to be playing some Rome Total War for a while. Now, for those of you who don't know, this is actually one of my favourite games of all time, and not only one of my favourite games of all time, but this is the game I've put more hours into than any other game in existence by a long, long way. Like, New Vegas is probably in the high hundreds of hours, and Pokemon, the fourth generation, Diamond, Pearl and Platinum, which I was a really big fan of. That was the last generation of Pokemon I was really into, to be honest. I think I have about, like, 400, 500 hours in that. Advance Wars 2, I've probably got a good 400 hours there as well. But Rome Total War, this is the only game I suspect I have over a thousand hours in. I don't know, because most of those hours are on an old CD version across various computers, so I don't like have the, um, the Steam time played thing to tell me, but I'm confident it'll be well over a thousand. If anything, I'd be scared it might be approaching 2,000. I played way too much of this back when I was a student, so we are going to be playing some of it today. So obviously we're going to be playing a Roman campaign. To be honest, if Rome Total War had a weakness, and well, it does have weaknesses, but I love it anyway. It's one of my favourite games of all time. But if it did have a weakness, it was that other than the, uh, the Roman campaigns, the other campaigns weren't really interesting enough, to be honest. The Roman campaigns were really, really good. But like the other campaigns, I'd never play a long campaign with any campaign other than Rome. The other campaigns, I'd always play short campaigns. Obviously, we're not going to have any advice. But let's ramp this right up to very difficult, shall we? Let's just put everything up to as very difficult as possible. And what's going on the management of all settlements? In Rome, you chose whether, like, uh, you could only manage a city when you actually had a general actually settled in it, whereas otherwise it would sort of quietly manage itself. I didn't really like that because it meant you left way too many generals just sitting in cities that weren't really doing much aside from, you know, very casually producing income. So I prefer to manage a settlement even if there's not a general present. And I prefer there to be no battle time limit because I don't really see the point in there being a battle time limit. I mean, the time limit is 45 minutes. It very rarely comes into play. But just occasionally in, like, massive, huge flare ups with reinforcements and cities and so forth, it's nice to be able to play things carefully and slowly and not have an arbitrary ticking clock floating around. And of course we will be going for the best of the Roman factions, the Brutii, because the Brutii are the best and everyone else absolutely sucks. There's various reasons the Brutii are amazing, we'll kind of cover them as we get to them, but the main one is that the, um, the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World are a thing in this game, and they're very, very powerful. Now, the Julii naturally expand in this direction, the Scipii naturally expand in this direction, and the Brutii naturally expand in this direction, and guess where literally all of the Wonders of the World are? Oh, they're all in this direction, so yeah, the Brutii are the best. We Brutii are the only true Romans. We saved Rome, we drove out the kings, we made the Republic. The family deserve respect for that. Respect and obedience. And if we've got time for it, a high resolution too. We know what is best for Rome. New lands, living space, territory, slaves. I know what must be done. The Greeks, they look down their perfumed noses at all Romans and they hate us. I'm going to give them a reason for hate. I've crushed them. Roman steel. That's the answer. Roman steel in the booty eye fist. And the other great Roman families. The Scipii. Trash. They have no respect for proper Roman ways. For us. The Julii prostitute themselves as if the people mattered. Bah. Brutii must lead Rome. The other nice thing about the Brutio campaign is you are blatantly playing as flipping supervillains. And here we go, beginning with a Senate mission. I've been asked to take Apollonia, and I'll get a pile of money if I do. Lovely. Welcome to Rome Total War. Now, some of you may have never seen this before, might be a little bit unfamiliar to you. So I will explain it as well as I can while I go along while keeping things a little bit brief. So this is the campaign map. Rome Total War was the first Total War game to have, like, a big 3D campaign map where, you know, your units could, like, stand all over the place and, like, positioning was important. And thus there were, like, you know, narrow mountain passes and bridges and crossings of rivers and stuff to, like, guard. And pretty much, like, the template that was laid down here in Rome Total War, the series hasn't really veered from much in decades because... When did this come out? This must be, like... 
a decade and a half, probably not too far off, two decades old or something. I can't remember what year Rome Total War came out, but it's very, very old. And like I fairly recently played uh, Total War Warhammer, and broadly how Rome Total War decides a Total War game ought to be, Total War Warhammer was still doing all of that stuff. So basically on this big old map you move stuff around, you've got agents like diplomats and spies, then you've got armies that are made up of stacks of units up to a stack of 20, you've got cities where you can manage things, everything is turn based while you're in the overworld, but when you actually get into the actual fight, the fights are actually real time and controlled manually, which I've always really really liked. If there's one thing I don't really like about Civilization 6, and by the way, I love Civilization 6, it's totally in line for being one of my games of the year, but if there's one thing I don't like, it's the fact that because you don't have any say in the battles yourself, basically just the unit with the biggest number will always win. Whereas in Rome Total War, if you had the skill and the strategy, a far smaller army, positioned correctly and managed carefully, could overcome a much bigger army, which I personally felt was much nicer. So kind of the combination of turn-based strategy in the overworld and very kind of cautious but interesting strategic combat in the actual fight. I always loved that. That was always kind of the real sweet spot of strategy games for me. These are my two cities, by the way. I'd explain why all of this is historically wrong, because those of you who don't know, I have a degree in classics. Kind of, you know, ancient history is my sort of a thing. And I'd explain how all of this is wrong and how this isn't really how Rome was organised, but it would take too long, because this isn't even bloody close to how Rome is organised. Because according to this game, basically, um, you've got Rome here, which is its own unique faction, and basically the Roman armies just hang out and guard Rome, and that's it. And then you've got one family up here, the Julii, who basically kind of go and take over Rome. And they're supposed to be like Julius Caesar or whatever. That's not how Julius Caesar works. Julius Caesar was not part of the Julii family. That's not even close to right. But I suppose you're supposed to like hear an echo of... Julius Caesar in there or whatever. And then we've got the Scipii who start over here in Capua and are supposed to like take over uh, Sicily and then go and smash Carthage. So, you know, like the famous Scipios that took over Carthage. That one's probably the closest to historically true because, you know, there were a series of Scipios that waged a series of war against Carthage. That was actually a thing. So that one's probably the closest to being true. And then down here in the south, everything just goes completely mad because then we've got the Bruti who just kind of hold all of South Italy and use that as a launching off point to take over Greece. And that doesn't even remotely make sense. That that is one of the ancient wonders of the world, by the way, the statue of Zeus at Olympia. Yeah, there's a lot of them in this direction. In fact, pretty much all the ancient wonders of the world are going to fall into uh, the Brutii hands, which is why being the Brutii is great, among many reasons. But yeah, the Senate just basically hung out in the city and told the other Roman families to go on and get on with conquering the world, until eventually one of them became popular and big enough to go and take over Rome. Again, not, not even remotely, history does not even come close to that, but we're just going to have to accept that that's how it works in this particular game. So let's get right into this, shall we? You saw earlier we actually got a little mission from Rome. They said to go and take over Apollonia, and they will reward you quite significantly for that. Especially in the early game, the rewards you can get from uh, Rome for doing their missions are really, really damn good. So it's worth doing them. So we need to go and take over this crappy little village of rebels. We're not declaring war on anyone because that symbol means these are basically just independent rebels. That's fine. We can double click on the village to get a little bit of information. So we know there is literally no building in this village. It's just like a collection of houses. Buildings mean like important uh, infrastructure, for example. And we know what the garrison is because we have visibility of the town from our ship. Sometimes you wouldn't get that good visibility. So we know we've got some hoplites and some basic peltas. So some little guys are just going to chuck stuff at me. That's absolutely fine. This is a tiny settlement. It's very, very poor, but we'll be able to do something about that. So we need to take it over. To take it over, we have got an army right here. We've got a Mulius Brutus, one of our family members, together with a whole bunch of units. Some infantry, a bloke of our own who can kind of toss javelins in and indeed some horsemen, as well as the actual general. The general doesn't have to go with the army, the army can go around by itself, but the general gives a lot of bonuses, and he comes with a very strong unit of cavalry himself, which is very, very welcome. If you kind of look how strong our cavalry is when you kind of send out cavalry by itself, so uh, attack 7, defense 13, compare that to the Roman general, attack 11, defense 14, so yeah, much, much better. The Roman general cavalry are very, very good indeed. So we need to get him over to Apollonia, luckily we've got a fleet right flipping here then. I also have some agents here. I've got a spy and I've got a diplomat. Both of them can do more good over here than they can do back here in Italy. Because in Italy, like, um, these guys are fellow Romans. They cannot attack us. The alliance that we've got with these guys is kind of like a special magic alliance that's unique to the Romans, where um, we have full visibility of what they're seeing. Normally, allies wouldn't give you that. And we physically are not allowed to attack each other, even if we wanted to, until very special conditions are met much later in the game. So we don't need to worry about those guys. We can 
completely ignored them. So let's get our spy in the boat too. And our diplomat as well. So let's just move our ship across the water right here to Apollonia. Lovely. Our guys are right here and my agents have kind of merged into this area. So now we're here. We simply declare, well, we don't really declare war. We simply attack this little settlement. We're officially besieging it. Now there's nothing to stop me actually besieging them out. Each settlement has a certain amount of food. So because this place has literally no infrastructure and thus, you know, no granary, no warehouses, no anything like that. As a result, they've got barely any food because they're basically a tiny little village that's just subsistence farming. So as a result, uh, two turns, the equivalent of one year of in-game time because this game goes through summer and then winter. Each turn represents six months. As a result, basically, they've got this year's harvest and then they'd have to give up. I think it's really elegant. It's a lovely touch that like the default for a city that's got no infrastructure is two turns, i.e. we've got this year's harvest, but we can't go out and plough the fields because we're under siege. So therefore, next year we're utterly screwed. We don't need to worry about that. Instead, we can just head straight in and kill these guys because they've got no walls of any description. Yeah, whoever drew this picture of the Siege of Apollonia was taking a little bit of artistic license. Not only do they not have massive stone walls, they've got no walls whatsoever. So we don't need to bother building siege equipment that would take time. In case you didn't get good visibility of what was going on in an army earlier, like when you get into this little battle deployment screen, this is the opportunity you can actually look at their numbers properly. So we can see exactly what's going on here and how strong they are. So if you want to get like the full stats of something, then it's very, very easy to do. Peltas, as you can see, yeah, they're not very good. Defense 4, melee attack 3, even their most powerful missile attack is only attack 6. So these guys are not very good in the slightest. They will be kind of ridden down by my horses nice and simply. The hoplite's the most interesting thing because they form a a really really strong wall of spears when they're facing one direction basically you just need to either take them out with indirect fire or get behind them so let's see what we can do here i could by the way auto resolve this battle because i'm clearly winning there's an excellent chance i'll win and generally like a 72 ratio like this you're pretty much 100 percent guaranteed to win but the thing is you'll take casualties if you auto resolve battles so it's better to fight them yourself like i've almost never seen a result in rome total war where the automatic result gives you a better result in terms of the number of casualties than you can do for yourself if you just handle the battles yourselves. This actually changed a lot in Medieval 2 Total War, where very often the computer could do a much better job storming a city than any human player can, because the computer just sort of magically seemed to avoid the wall defences. But never mind, let's fight to this battle by hand just so I can show off how that works too. And zoomy downy we go. Over there stand the rebel slaves. They are braver and more worthy than men of their type have any right to be. There is no shame in fear. There is only shame in letting fear rule you. Try not to look scared and you'll find bravery in your heart. Yeah, the generals gave cool little speeches. When you're just taking on little kind of rebel slaves, they're not that interesting. But later in the game, like the generals will start throwing out incredibly racist slurs against whoever you're taking on. It's really, really good. But yeah, that was a very short speech because we're just taking on some basic rebels. But there was lots of really fun factors about your army and their army and who you were taking on and where you were taking them on that would actually affect like what the general would say. So there were some really fun speeches, which again, this sort of seemed to kind of drop out of Total War. There's lots of stuff that was really fun in this era of Total War that seemed to drop out. It kind of returned in Medieval 2 Total War, but there wasn't as much fun and variety in it. And then it just seemed to have completely dropped out by the time of Total War Warhammer. So that was a shame. Anyway, start the deployment. Basically, I need to just pick where I'm starting from. I can start anywhere inside these uh, green boundaries here. And this is obviously affected by which way you were approaching. So, you know, I actually came down from the sea. You can see my, uh, my boats over there. So I came over by boat. So my boats are actually visible in the distance. And I approached from the northwest. So therefore, my army by default is in the northwest. And the only places I can deploy are either over in the north or over in the west. And anything that's actually on the world map is also here as well. So if there's lots of forests on the world map, for example, then there'll be lots of forests here and that can give certain tactical advantages. All of that was just absolutely lovely because it genuinely made it feel like the world map and the battle maps were connected. And in some kind of later Total War games, I never got that feeling. It felt like there was a massive disconnect between the two. But this was the game that really made it feel like what you were seeing down here was a logical and real extension of what you'd been seeing from above, which was great. Now, let's deploy here. So obviously we'll mainly be walking just straight down the main street here that's fine so we'll take my hastati these are my basic infantry lads they've got a little throwing spear the pilum that they can toss out before they charge in they are light infantry but they'll do the job i've also got my velites i'll put them up front for now but they'll potentially kind of retreat behind my infantry if they get into trouble these guys can throw little javelins the 
They're very, very weak, but they'll do a good job if you can kind of get hits in on something without being hit in return. And my general can hang out with these lads just at the back for now, but potentially will kind of charge him around a bit more later. Now, I can, of course, split up my army. There's no reason for it to all be together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have my Equites, my little light cavalry, over on the side here. So if there's a good opportunity, then my Equites can basically just charge up this side street here and basically slam into the rear of something. That's going to be a little bit difficult to do because, yeah, there's almost certainly going to be one enemy just hanging out here. So that probably won't fly, but just on the off chance it does, we'll give it a go. Let's start the battle and see what happens. So what are we looking at? We are looking at the two groups of Peltas are just hanging out in the city centre and there's one group of Hoplites that appear to be on the move. That's fine. These are the only guys that are in any way dangerous. Not really dangerous, it's just they could do a little bit of damage to me if I let them. Let's just see what these guys are planning to do for a second, because normally one of them might decide to try and come and get me, but no. Also, I will say, it's kind of impressive that a village this size that literally has... Hang on, how many houses have we got here? I count 23 houses total and no other sign of any villages or farms nearby and they seem to have been able to muster hundreds of people to defend the town. Bloody impressive. Right, let's just start moving our troops forward because often that will stir these guys into action. Let's just put you guys into formation, we'll just group you, and then we'll just start slowly moving you guys forward. That will do. So you guys will now just start slowly moving forward. This is what I loved about Roman Total War, how big it was. I've said the unit scale to be huge, by the way. This is the biggest number of units that you can have per, like, basic group of infantry. Because, like, you know, if you had a less intensive computer, because this was years and years and years ago, if you wanted to, you could have only, like, I think, like, the smallest you could have, like, 8 or 12 units per unit of infantry but no i have got more like 160 troops of infantry guys guys don't run into the back of the infantry for goodness sake but uh yeah i've got it as big as it can be guys i'm not sure you understand how formation works like i appreciate your bravery steve but it's not gonna fly now i'm gonna move this group of velites actually within the town border if you like because like this little this little faint little kind of brown smear that's a circle, that kind of marks what they consider to be like the edge of the village proper. So if I actually send troops onto the town street, they might respond by starting to send something in my vague direction. Yep, here we are, we've got movement. They've detected something. What are they going to do? One of their units decides to spread themselves right out. Another unit is, aha. Now this is, if this is actually what they're going to do, this is perfect. One of their units of Peltas has decided they're going to advance forward. Now I'm going to assume my Velites, who are also my little throwy javelin guys, have the same range. You can see there, their range is extremely limited. And I'm assuming these guys' this range is going to be exactly the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wait for them to go a little bit further because they've just kind of, you know, seen some Velites and they think, okay, we can get into a little bit of a javelin versus javelin fight here. So they're going to come forward and try and skirmish against my skirmishers. What I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to wait for a second then I'm going to send my heavy cavalry thundering forward who's just going to slam into them and murder them because my general's unit can easily handle these guys. Ah, better and better. They've decided to send their hoplite as well. Right. Let's, oh no, they've not decided to send the hoplites. The hoplites have moved into position, but they're not advancing yet. Fine. I loved how you could get right down to it. Come on. All right, horsemen. Let's see what we've got going on here. And in a moment, they'll probably realize their catastrophic mistake. Nope, they've decided against it. And sm <laughs> Yeah, the initial charge was very powerful. So they've routed right now, which basically means they're running away. Uh, and that means you can just ride them down incredibly easily. So they're down from like 160 people to... What is that? 23. Um, we've lost... I think we might have lost, like, one guy. We may have lost a horseman. Hang on, let's just uh, back off over here. Yes, indeed. In the charge, we lost two guys. You've got to be careful, because you can lose your general. But uh, on this occasion, that did not happen. Uh, so they've just lost a significant portion of their strength immediately. What I really want to do is I want to just take out all of their Peltas before we actually get into the Hoplites. And by the way, wasn't this game really very pretty? Like, I know it looks a tiny bit scruffy these days, but... It still looks really fairly attractive, I think. Like, especially when you've got all the units moving together. I think it's genuinely still a very attractive game. Now, this is where life's going to get a little bit more on the tricky side, which is their hoplites have decided to come along too. So, this is where my backup becomes useful. I'm going to bring my cavalry into the town. I'm going to see what happens as a result. So my cavalry is just going to come thundering in. Because if we hold the town centre for a certain period of time, uncontested, then we've basically won. 
So as a result, I just want to... We might take a little bit of damage here. Uh, so you're going to... Yeah, I'm hoping their hoplite's going to back off the moment my cavalry hit the town centre. If not, you see they've formed up their... They've formed up their phalanx, by the way. And here we go. Yes, indeed, this works. Okay, now... Perfect. My general can now thunder in and take out these guys because their hoplites have panicked because my equites have just gone and taken the flipping uh, town square. So their hoplites are now rushing back into the town. I need my guys to throw one more uh, exchange and then get out of there. These guys are just going to smash into these guys. These guys are going to immediately break. My equites are going to back off, obviously, because I actually am not that interested in any of the rest of it. I'm just going to wipe out these guys. And no, 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 no. Don't actually, no, don't take on the hoplites. You do not want to be taking on the hoplites, okay? Wipe out as many as you can, but then back off. Okay, lovely. At this point, their Peltas are as good as taken care of. Now, I back off my general. Their Hoplites don't know what to bloody do with themselves. I'm just actually going to keep my general close by to bait their Hoplites forward. Because Hoplites are incredibly strong, but they're also incredibly slow when they're in the Phalanx. That's their weakness. They're strong, but they're slow. So now I'm just going to just move my general forward a little bit just to bait them. And, oh, yep, hang on. Do we know what they want to do? And, no, yes, yes, here we are. So now I can just smash into the back of these guys. So now just very gently into the back of here. My Equitas are now killing those guys. Lovely. So my Equitas are now murdering the rest of the units. My general backs off. Now, at this point, my Equitas are, can now just basically murder all of the Peltas, completely destroying all of their indirect fire capability. That's it. That's now done. So their indirect fire is now taken care of. Uh, these guys now don't know what to do. I'm going to send my Velites forward and I'm just going to move my general back. Yeah, at this point the Hoplites are confused. Some of them would like to go and defend... Oh, good. They've done this thing. Sometimes when the air got really confused, its units started kind of splitting up a little bit. So at this point, my Velites can just hang out right about... Okay, just, here is fine. Here is fine. Okay, guys, just stop there and start throwing things at these guys. So now we can just start peppering these guys because even though they're very, very tough and phalanxes are truly one of the most dangerous things in this game, regardless, we can now just start peppering them. So my Velites are basically out of throwable spears. So at this point, I can probably start moving my Hastati forward to throw their spears in too. So now we just need to have a single final little conclusive engagement to wrap this up. Guys, you're going to be wanting to get out of there. That's fine. You just run out of there. The horses will easily work around the hot place. Might lose one on the way out if they get lucky. Nope, we're fine for the moment. So now these guys are split up. They're confused. We're just going to go and toss in our throwables. Lovely. There we are. So now we just toss in a bunch of... Oh, yeah, they're doing the hoplite dance. This happens sometimes when the hoplites didn't know what they wanted to do. Do the hoplite dance, you magnificent bastard. And the hoplite dance involves dying, by the way. And now they are going to... No, 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 guys, don't actually engage. Because you've got a second pilum you can throw yet. So everyone back off for a second. And continue tossing spears at them. So I'm just moving my unit of a starter that still has spears into range of these guys. Shortly we should enter range of them. Yes, indeed. Just tell them to pause there. I've got fire at will check, so they're just tossing their remaining spears in a moment. There we go. So that'll do even more damage to these guys. And lovely. Yeah, these guys are not that good. Just keep tossing in the spears. They'll march over. And take even more damage. And as soon as they leave that area, I'm just going to send my horses just smash into the rear. They'll instantly break. So the moment they're off this area, they'll be screwed. So now just send my guys over to here. Now into the rear. Yep. Engage and engage. Horses round the corner. And in a split second, my horses will just round the corner. Go into the rear of them. They'll instantly die. And that will be you done. Marvellous. So they are wavering and they will break momentarily and they are broken or rather their general's dead and that will be the end of them. Oh, Rome will be amazed at such a victory. The day is ours! Now that was a very cautiously fought battle by the way. Obviously I won't be fighting every battle that cautiously. I just kind of wanted to show off how 
positioning, careful use of your units could mean that you won very overwhelming victories. So in that case, yeah, we killed all of them and we lost only 62 in return. Let's just get some details there because you can see exactly like what's happened there. So my Roman general actually picked up a bit of experience for killing all of those Peltas. Units just get stronger as they picked up experience. They picked up, I think, plus one to all their attack stats and plus one to defense per unit of experience. I think you can get up to... Nine experience? I'm having a nine experience unit was very, very rare indeed. They took casualties, they inflicted casualties, and they also heal casualties after the end of the battle. So if one of your units of infantry got in a straight slugging fight with a phalanx, like these guys did, then as a result of that, they might take 34 casualties, but they're not going to have any healed because the guys who died, or rather ended up on the floor, had been kind of, you know, brutally stabbed in straight up combat. Whereas the Welites here, who took 24 casualties, seven of them recovered because they took those casualties from throwing javelins at the other javelin throwers. So sure, some of them might have got some javelins in the leg or whatever, which would have taken them out of the fight, but they would have been able to recover later. So not all these guys on the ground are dead, in fact. Anyway, let's continue onwards and we'll head back out to the world screen now. So there we are. Apollonia now belongs to us. We can choose what we want to do with it. We can occupy the settlement, which basically just means moving in. You can enslave the population, which means a portion of the population is taken and migrated to other cities in your empire. Not worth doing here. In fact, very rarely worth doing at all, but situationally and tactically could be very useful. Or you can just exterminate the people. You'll get a bit of money for looting the town, but really the only reason you'd want to do that was if it was like a massive city that was incredibly culturally different to yours, because cultural differences led to to some very big amounts of unhappiness that sometimes meant the only way you could feasibly manage a massive city you'd taken from a different empire was if you actually burnt it to the ground and basically rebuilt it from scratch. But no, we're just going to move in and occupy it. Now the Senate was happy with us doing that. They have granted me 5,000 denarii, which is a lot of money in this game. So we're up to 10,050. 5,000 we started with, 5,000 from the Senate, and 50 we just got from just kind of carrying off some stuff from this town. So Apollonia now belongs to me. And don't forget, by the way, we have agents here that could be more usefully going elsewhere. In particular, our diplomat needs to start moving down here towards the Greeks. And I would say our spy probably will ultimately be able to do the same thing. But I want my spy to head up here first because my spy, yes indeed, Salona. Okay, so we've got another rebel village right up there. So we'll be thinking about what's going on elsewhere in the world momentarily, but first we've now got to get into the actual management of the Empire, because, well, technically we could actually move our other... Let's just move our other army around here. Let's just move the fleet to... Yeah, move the fleet back into the docks. Uh, fleets were safe in docks, by the way. Naval combat could only happen in the open sea, so if you just moved your fleets into the docks, they were 100% safe. Let's just send our guy over here. And then we've got our two cities here that also have people inside them. So how you read this, by the way, is that's the amount of money that a town is producing. That's how happy it is right now, and that's... That's what's happening to its population. You may be a little bit confused at a glance as to why it is that Apollonia is producing 690 in income, whereas an established Roman town like Croton down here is only producing seven. And that's because, and this was really confusingly done by the way, um, the way that the game calculated how much a settlement is producing is it weighted how much a settlement ought to be producing. So Croton's actually producing a large amount of money, but because it's one of our biggest settlements, the game's saying that it ought to be producing a large amount of money, and actually Croton is only producing seven gold more per turn than what it ought to be producing. Apollonia, because it's absolutely tiny and only just entered the empire, the game is saying it only ought to be producing a tiny amount of money, and it's actually producing significantly more than that. So we kind of go into this, we can actually get a full like, breakdown of this. So Croton right now, in terms of its income, is generating, yeah, it's generating like 700, these are denarii, sorry, not technically gold, and you know, it's producing some money for administration, trade is very, very small for the moment, but that will become much bigger later, taxes in the early game and farming are the much bigger sources of your income, so you know, this place is producing like a lot of money, in terms of like 600 from farming, 600 to 700 from taxes, but the game is assuming it ought to be paying for a very significant proportion of the armed forces and the general salaries. Whereas if we go over to, let's just go and find somewhere else here. Yeah, Apollonia. Apollonia, meanwhile, is still producing a fair amount of taxes, but much less on the farms, much less on the taxes. You know, actually, it's producing a fair amount of admin. I guess you're a good administrator. Well done. But it's only supposed to produce a very tiny amount of income. So that's why it looks like it's making the bigger profit. Anyway, now we need to get into actually managing the empire. The way this worked, by the way, if you've never played a Total War game before, is basically every town had two queues that you could always be using. So it's not like Civ where you have to choose whether to put the production in a town towards like uh, building the infrastructure or producing the armies. You got your recruitment and your town simultaneously, and you could be building both at once. Also, literally everything 
everything in this game is about money. The only currency is, well, currency, to be honest. So as a result, everything was bought with money. Um, all your infrastructure you bought with money, all of your people you bought with money. There was no like infrastructure you could build to produce units faster, because pretty much everything was just built in one turn. Every unit was built in one turn, apart from some specialised units, and also war dogs. War dogs, even though they weren't that good and were very situational, took two turns to train. I was never sure why that was, because you could train, yeah, like two units of cavalry in the same amount of time it took to train one unit of war dogs, which didn't really make sense because cavalry was vastly more useful than war dogs. But whatever, that was the decision that was made long ago, and the decision shall stand as far as I'm concerned. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to make money. We need to make as much money as possible in order to fund an army. This game was very much in favour of extremely aggressive expansionism. So, I'm going to put the taxes up to very high in my capital. And Apollonia can have high, but not very high. Apollonia goes straight down to mid-level happiness immediately. Because Apollonia's got problems with culture penalties. Because technically this is like a rebel settlement, not really ours. But we can fix that by converting the town to be a Roman settlement by building a governor's house. So we're going to build one of those immediately. That'll be done in one turn. Then Apollonia will be a much better Roman town. We can probably put the taxes up a little bit. Croton, however, that can definitely go up to... Let's just put that up to high, not very high. Obviously, this produced more money, but it slowed down the population growth rate because high taxes slowed down growth. Back in Italy, however, we've got a bit of a problem, which is both at Croton and Tarentum, we cannot actually currently train any more Hastati, who are kind of the backbone of our infantry. So for the moment, uh, yeah, at Tarentum, I'm going to be building a militia barrack so I can start producing Hastati. Because until I've got that, not only can I not build more Hastati, I have no way of healing the Hastati I've already got out on campaign. So I'm going to be needing that as a priority. Over in Crotorn, however, they've got something missing, which is Tarentum has a port and Crotorn doesn't. So we're most definitely going to be wanting to get hold of some of that. So if you just kind of look at the trade, when you kind of built something, it showed you what difference that would make, which was nice. So right now, Crotorn is making 91 gold through trade. If I build a port, that is going to jump from 91 to 223. So that is like, what, seven, eight turns. That's basically going to have paid for itself and we're going to be in pure profit. And also the admin's going to go up by three. Nice. Good old admin. So that is definitely a good thing to build as well. And indeed, right now in Croton, there's not much we can do in terms of building troops. Peasants are just pretty bloody worthless, to be honest, in terms of military forces. Town watch are okay if you're in an absolute pinch, but not really worth considering at all. Instead, I'm going to build one more diplomat here. Just having a couple of diplomats wandering around the map speaking to people can be very, very useful indeed. So I just have one diplomat from there. And to rent them, however, I'm going to go and get myself a horseman. Lovely, because cavalry are spectacularly good. You also need to think carefully about who was where in terms of your family, by the way. Because, yeah, members of your family were not just good generals and good military units and good at that sort of thing. Some of them were actually terrible at military command, but much better at other things. So this was basically represented by their three stats, command, management, and influence. So this guy, he could be an okay commander, but command ability is at best a yawning gap in this man's personality. But he's young, he's 34, potentially we could kind of get him much better, that sort of thing. He's okay at management. I know the game is saying that administration is not this man's forte. He can manage simple matters, but without skill. A person with one management, I think it's out of 10, it can max out at 10. A person with one management is better than a town with no administrator whatsoever, but influence he's pretty good at. So that basically counts as bonus happiness. So if we go over to Croton, for example, we've got our faction leader here, and he's a pretty good commander, and he's also got himself a pretty good amount of influence. So if we look at the happiness of this town here, public order is half the governor's influence and half the garrison. So basically, if I was to take the faction leader out of the city right now, then the happiness would drop by 25%, and I'd have to lower the tax rate accordingly. So high influence people are worth keeping keeping in productive cities purely for the sake that you can keep the tax rate high. He's also got a retinue, and the retinues often have the most kind of important bonuses of all. So, for example, the faction leader's got the drill master here, which is plus 25% movement points, because armies can now force march, and also he gets 10% discount on unit training costs. So having him somewhere where we're training lots of troops could be a good idea. Meanwhile, over in Tarentum, we've got this guy who's actually a very capable management person. As a mathematics expert, he gets 10% bonus on all trade income, which is nice. What I also really love about this game was these really kind of changed organically over time. If you just took a general and just dumped him in a backwater in the middle of nowhere and just left him to it, he would basically slowly become a mad, raving, incompetent, corrupt drunk. Because he'd never really experienced, like, you know, life in a in a good city where he had a good education. He'd never been on campaign. He'd never experienced the wider world. So you generally needed to treat your kind of administrator competently. You couldn't just dump them somewhere or they would slowly become absolutely bloody useless. And investing in education so that they could actually become and then stay smart was a good idea. Because they'll also have children and they'll often pass on traits to their children. So you really want to make sure you've got good people producing good children as far as you can. Anyway, that's pretty much all we can do this first turn. Sorry, that was a lot of explanations. But now 
now we've kind of covered the basics, we shouldn't need to do that again. Let's move on from flipping turn one. And now we just get to quickly see what's going on in the rest of the world. Lovely. And the Senate has given me another mission. They want me to take the settlement of Odia. Oh they want me to take over a Greek town. Well... We're going to have to see about that, because I may not actually flipping bother. The game often pushed you in the direction it wanted you to go, simply by kind of giving you missions that pointed you in the right direction. So if I was the Skippy Eye, the game would be giving me missions to take out Syracuse, and then the Carthaginians, and then go over and take out the rest of Carthage, for example. Meanwhile, the Julii, who, ah, they have indeed already taken over a basic village here, and they've basically converted that into a little town. They'll be being told to go and take care of the Gauls. But yeah, the game's trying to push me into a war with Greece to encourage me. Let's not rush into that too quick however though actually we do actually have a Macedonian diplomat right here good my diplomat can go up to him and I would like to first up I just want to offer him trade rights so let's start trading with each other we accept your offer generous and fair lovely next up you want to swap map information for map information later on you can try and extort people for map information but for now this will do and oh they want money for map information meet me halfway here Macedonia 300 Okay, lovely. Generous and fair. Lovely. That'll do for now. I do not want an alliance with these guys. Absolutely flipping not. But now what's happened is I now have visibility of all of Macedonia's settlements, which is good. Uh, the really nice thing, by the way, was, and I was never quite sure whether this was really a bug or not, but I'm willing to use it anyway because I don't think it is. Um, basically, if you um, hold right click over an area, it tells you kind of who it belongs to. But this still worked, even if you couldn't actually see an area anymore. So right now, as far as I'm concerned, all these cities are Macedonian, because they've told me all these cities are Macedonian. However, this city here could theoretically, it's its not, but it could theoretically currently be being besieged by the Greeks or the Thracians who are over here. And if that did happen, the next turn that would be a Thracian city, but my map would still say a Macedonian city because I can't actually see it. And until I actually get someone over there who's got eyes on it, I won't know. However, if I actually hover over it with the right click, I can still see that says Macedonian right there. So if that ever changed to Thrace, that would actually automatically update to say Thrace. Even if the city still had the Macedonian symbol on my world map, I could actually know it had changed hands just by kind of hovering over things. So once you've seen something once, you kind of have visibility of it forever, which is kind of cool. Anyway, let's get my diplomat moving down here towards the Greeks. We want to have a chat with them before we get to anything else. Uh, can we chat with you, by the way? No, we can't quite get to you anyway. Let's just see if we can work around the little army that's hanging out here. Because, yes, would you believe the Greeks are a little bit interested in the bloody Romans that just showed up on their shores? Apollonia, which is now a good Roman settlement. In fact, remember how it looked last time? We can actually go and see how it looks now that I've built the governor's house, and thus I've kind of rebuilt this city to be a bit more Roman. So go into the settlement details, and then click the little magnifying glass here. View the settlement on the battle map. This was something that completely dropped out of the game after Rome Total War. It wasn't in Medieval 2, it wasn't in Total War Warhammer. I kind of hope it was in one of the other games, but this was always one of my favourite things, that you can actually go down on the ground and look at the settlement. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, things have changed a little bit. We've uh, basically, in six months, we've built all of this, which is a little bit optimistic, but uh, never mind, eh? So, yes, this is now what the settlement looks like. And you can see, obviously, it's still exactly the same as it ever was. The game doesn't, like, you know, randomly generate the terrain around it. You've still got those mountains in the background, that clump of forest over there. You've still got the same little kind of areas down here and whatever. The game keeps a permanent memory as to what's like in each location. So all that's changed here is the town. And you can actually see, by the way, over there, that over the water is supposed to be the port of Tarentum because that there is Italy. Like, it's, oh, it's just beautiful, isn't it? And now if you go down onto the ground, everyone is dressed like a Roman because this place has become culturally very, very Roman. And if we go in here, right now there's no real buildings of interest. There's just the the governor's house. Where's the governor's house? It's somewhere around here. Ah, there it is. I've found the governor's house right here. So we built this governor's house. And because the main administrative building in the town is Roman, that means the rest of the town automatically converts to Roman as well. Unless the barbarians had built something else here, in which case that would remain barbarian until such time as I actually built over it. Which actually makes the town's really, really beautiful little patchwork sometimes. Rome Total War was brilliant to that, but never really happened again. And the nice thing about this screen, of course, is it allows you to kind of plan your defence. So, for example, if you know an army's coming from the north, and thus they're very likely to be drawn up here, you can actually look at your city and think, okay, how am I going to defend it? Where's the most sensible place to kind of try and bottleneck things? And you can kind of plan things here, and like, you know, you've got a big open courtyard in front of the governor's house here that might be useful for something. It was just lovely, by the way. There were just so many lovely touches. Like, just over here, this isn't like a building I've built or anything. There's just a... There's just a garden here, a slightly twitchy garden where the shaders are messing up, but you know, it's still here, it's still lovely. And as you build more buildings, they'll all appear in the town, you can actually go down and see them. And it's beautiful, and I don't know why this wasn't in later Total War games. 
Anyway, first things first, if the Greeks might be showing an interest, let's at least build a wooden palisade. That means they can't just march in like we did, they'd actually have to put us under siege and build some battering rams. So even if things go all wrong with Greece, we do at least have, you know, like a turn or two of grace before things go completely wrong. My spy can just keep heading up here. Yeah, I know there's another settlement around here. I think it might be like over there, if I'm recalling correctly. I just need to remember where all the settlements are before we go too much further. So, of course, Tarentum and Croton are still building their buildings because the port needs... I think the port needs... Yeah, the port's half done. Meanwhile, the militia barracks takes three turns to be done. So that's done for the moment. We've already built that in Apollonia. So we've still got 7,000 in the bank and we don't need to build anything else this turn. Good. However, we've got something else here, which is cavalry now. This is where we start getting into what I actually want to do this run. Because obviously, you know, you sort of put this on to very hard, very hard. So this is the hardest Rome Total War can be. I don't just want to win, by the way. I want to show how you absolutely flipping humiliate the other Roman families. Because ultimately, of course, the alliance between me and the Scipii and the Julii breaks down. There's supposed to be like a big war and diddly diddly dee. So um, as a result of that, you know, eventually like, you know, the Scipii is supposed to expand in this direction. And I think kind of the way the game kind of sees you going is the Scipii take over Sicily. Then they move and take over the rest of Africa. And then they kind of take over large parts of Spain while also simultaneously expanding down here towards Egypt. And they like take over Egypt. The Judo, meanwhile, expanded to Gaul and Germania, and kind of, you know, ultimately there's a border between the Julii and the Scipii between Spain and France in terms of modern day parlance. And the Julii will also get Britain, and they'll probably just expand out here towards the barbarians. The Julii campaign's a bit boring to my mind, because you spend a lot of time taking on barbarian settlements, and they're just not as interesting as the Carthaginian or the Greek or the other Middle Eastern ones are. Now, to ensure that happens, the game basically cheats in favour of your AI allies. The Romans will basically do a very good job taking over the world. It's almost impossible for them not to. I'm going to try and show you how you actually screw over your allies so badly that actually the civil war becomes basically a flipping formality by nipping this little problem in the bud. And the way we're going to do that is by helping in inverted commas. So that unit of cavalry I just trained, I'm just going to send that north. I'm going to send it to go and help out, inverted commas again, very important, note the inverted commas. I'm going to send that up north to help out the Julii with their wars. Because the special alliance we've got with the other Romans means basically I've got access to all their territories. I'm allowed to wander through their lands. I'm allowed to send armies through their lands. And if we ever like have my army next to a Roman army, basically I'll always be pulled into the battle as reinforcements to help them out. And you can use that very tactically to your advantage and their disadvantage. We'll get into that as it becomes relevant. Also, we've got a diplomat here. I'm just going to start sending him north as well. I want to go and have a chat with the Gauls and all the other barbarians up in this direction. Back in our empire, however, for the moment, Apollonia's got a bit of a difficult situation going on, which is Apollonia currently has a population of 922, growing by 2.5% per turn, meaning they're going to be picking up, what's that, like 20, 25 people each turn. In other words, they're going to be growing extremely bloody slowly. That's fine. I can do things to increase the growth rate. I can invest in their farming, for example. We've got a bigger problem here, which is this game treated population intelligently, which is, say, the only thing I can actually train here is a unit of peasants. Peasants are useless, but there's a bigger problem. A unit of peasants is made up of 240 soldiers. If I build a unit of peasants in this town, that will actually take 240 out of the population in order to make up the peasants. I've literally drained the population by an amount that it will take years to recover from, purely for the sake of producing a useless military unit. So for the moment at least, like for this town to actually keep growing, I can't actually do that. The bigger settlements, like for example Croton, that's 4,400 and also growing at 2.5%. So that's growing at more like 100, 110 odd people per turn. Now this comes back to unit scale, which I was talking about earlier, because again, the population that's in a town is static. It doesn't matter what unit scale you're playing with, the population in a town is just a thing the game calculates flat across all of the scales. So if you're playing on a huge population, cities becoming underpopulated because you're draining so many people into your armies is a much bigger problem than if your unit scale is set to smaller. You genuinely can have underpopulation crises because your cities aren't growing whenever you're actually trading armies when unit scale is set to huge, which makes such a lot of sense and it adds a whole new tactical dilemma to the game that on the smaller unit scales isn't even in this game, which is fantastic. Also, you may notice this is now winter at the moment, which means a whole bunch of snow has kind of swept down into this area. This is vaguely, well, it's mostly historically accurate. Things used to be colder a couple of millennia ago, okay? So the idea of there being 
being in winter, basically blanket snow across modern day France and right up to northern modern day Italy and even right down into Greece is not beyond the realms of possibility. It used to be a lot colder, it used to snow a lot more. In fact, in terms of population, I can demonstrate this to you. So the population in Croton, a large town, are 4,406 at the moment. If I go over into recruitment and select a peasant, which is kind of one of the biggest units in the game because like it's a very large number of crappy peasants. If I build that right now, straight over in settlement details, population has dropped to 4,166. Obviously I can cancel that if I want to, it'll go back to how it was. But this was a real problem because basically the way the game calculated when you're allowed to move up to the next level of settlement in terms of like tiers, because there's five tiers of settlement, a town, a large town, a minor city, a large city and a huge city was entirely based on population. So I think it was six 6,000 for a city, does it say? I swear it says somewhere in the game, but I believe you need 6,000 population to build a governor's palace, you need 12,000 for a proconsul's palace, and then 24,000 for an imperial palace. And only once a minor city was built could you build all the tier 3 buildings. So for example, until I've actually got a minor city, I am incapable of building Prinkipes, who are the next step up in infantry, much tougher, hit a lot harder, generally a lot better. So on the huge unit scale, you had this really fun situation where if you kept spawning units too quickly, then your cities weren't growing fast enough to reach minor city or large city status, and that meant technologically you were falling behind because you couldn't invest into the biggest things. It was fascinating, and that's why I love playing this game on the huge setting, because it adds this whole new tactical level that doesn't exist in the game otherwise. Now, something I should have done last turn, by the way, is all of the troops that are floating around in my cities. I really need to get these guys on the move. You may notice Croton's just gone down to, yeah, mid-level happiness rather than really happy because, yeah, the garrison being present in the town keeps these guys happy as well. But I really need these units of Astarte heading over here to help out. Let's just send this guy over here. The others can catch up later. So I'm going to send this ship over here. So now we've got our secondary army led by... What were your name? You were Aulus Brutus. You're my faction. Which actually means he gets more horsemen. The faction and the faction is getting an even bigger bodyguard. So these guys hit really flipping hard. And he's also brought some fresh Astarte and Velites with him. Now, as I've got loads of money, but potentially I'm going to struggle to train troops for the moment. Well, not really struggle, but you know what I mean. But potentially it's sensible not to train troops too damn hard. I'm going to buy my own units of um, hoplites. Basically, if mercenary hoplites are available, always flipping buy them. And mercenary peltas as well. They're a bit on the expensive side of mine. They cost like 850. But uh, it is definitely worth doing. I mean, yeah, buying actually a unit of cavalry is only 420. But it's like double that to buy into hoplites. But hoplites are well worth it. Definitely bring those guys along. So my next big move is actually not down towards the Greeks. I kind of want to hold off fighting the Greeks. In fact, I believe, hang on, uh, Senate... What's the current mission you've given me there? Your reward is... Ah, they're going to reward me with a unit of Triarii, who are a solid group of spearmen, but it's not a big pile of money. I'm potentially willing to pass that up for the minute, because I don't want to actually have a war with Greece. Instead, I'm much more interested in heading north up here to these barbarian settlements, because some of these guys are well worth grabbing as soon as possible. So, first things first, I need to leave at least a basic army here to guard Apollonia just to make sure the Greeks don't get ideas. You're only two units, and we'd also have some basic town defences up soon, because once there's a wall up, walls have little towers that spit arrows. They're not great, but they're okay. Uh, you are, yeah, you've got two good units of infantry and some velites there. So I'm going to give you a unit of Hastati, and I'm going to give you my horsemen as well. So that means you are, hmm, you good enough to, you're probably good enough to go and take these towns at the minute. And plus I'll have more reinforcements coming in soon. Yeah, I kind of don't want to leave Apollonia with less than those three units, just on the off chance someone gets some funny ideas. Now, I'm going to move these guys up here, and within my own territory, what I can also do is I can build a fort or a watchtower. Watchtowers cost 200, but give me visibility. Forts provide temporary defences for armies on the move. Generally, they're not so worthwhile. Unless you're about to come under attack from a massive army, you can see is just there, and you're kind of blockading a narrow pass. Not really worth it. So, as it's my own territory, I'm going to build a watchtower, and that grants me permanent visibility around this area. Generally, I just go around dropping watchtowers everywhere because they're really bloody useful. Also, apparently Tarentum is at a low tax rate. I don't know why that is, but they can stop that right now. Straight up to flipping very high taxes, thank you. Oh yeah, that makes a huge difference. 
I must have misclicked at some point when I was setting the tax rate. Oops. Okay, following Turner, things are looking much better. Croton just gained a port, and you can see the trade routes have already started to pop up, kind of being traced along the sea there, which is very, very convenient indeed. And Apollonia, meanwhile, actually has a wall around it. Good. Next essential thing, roads. Roads are bloody useful. Actually, you know what? I'm going to build the... Actually, roads only want to. I was about to say, I'll build land clearance in terms of, like, basic farming. Sometimes you'll come across really fertile areas, and sometimes you'll come across really unfertile areas. That's, like, average fertility. Let's see if I can actually check that. Yeah, so, for example, Tarentum's much higher. The base farming level there is 4.5, so that settlement can just grow faster by default and a tiny bit faster than Croton. But like both the starting cities are pretty high in the fertility, Apollonia is less fertile, which kind of makes sense. It's kind of, you know, most of it's right by the sea, it's very mountainous. A lot of the area across kind of ancient Greece was actually not particularly fertile because it was so flipping mountainous. It was relatively hard for them to have massive populations because they couldn't really sustain them. So let's get these Hastati moved over here into the right area. Lovely. You guys just go over there. Drop off the two units of Hastati. They're now on the new Greek frontier. Lovely. And the fleet can move back down over here. The horsemen I trained can actually join up with the fleet. That can move out next time because I'm now going to send one horseman down here to go and help out. Again, note the inverted commas. The Scipii. And speaking of which, my first unit of horsemen actually gets over here and is now basically at the border of the Julii territory. Perfect. So now I've got horsemen ready to go and help out both of my allies. Inverted commas probably there. And Croton, conveniently enough, can actually have mines apparently. Ah, now mines. Mines are good. Mines basically are really expensive but fast throw up. So 2,000 denarii in just two turns. That's really, really flipping expensive. Like, you know, a militia barracks would only cost 1,200 denarii and take three turns to build. So mines are intensive, but they basically provide you with a flat 200 mining and can be upgraded later for a flat 350 mining. Basically, you always want to build these because they'll pay for themselves in 10 turns and then you're just into profit forever. So definitely worth having. And in fact, let's go and also have a quick chat with the Greeks. We definitely want... Actually, let's see if we can just get trade rights and map information out of them right now. Come on. Nice. Okay, so I've got trade rights and map information out of the Greeks. Perfect. So now I know where all the Greek cities are. And they're very, very scattered. The Greek city-states, by the way, this is even more historically baffling. So this is one faction that acts as a unified military force, which currently occupies over here, also occupies Sparta, doesn't hold Athens, holds Syracuse over here, as well as holding Pergamum in Phrygia, and also holding, yeah, holding Rhodes as well, and possessing the Colossus of Rhodes, which interestingly is not actually on the harbour, they've just kind of built it on top of a hill. Sure, why the bloody hell not? I cannot even begin to explain to you how badly this is not history. Like, we've got some sort of stupid Trojan log going on up here, Athens mysteriously just belongs to the rebels, the Greeks hold Syracuse, even though there was this big thing, it was called the Syracusan War, that very, very firmly decided the Greeks did not own Syracuse, <laughs> alright? They just didn't. At the real period of history right now, the question of Syracuse was much more about who had more diplomatic influence over them, was it Carthaginians or Romans, and the Syracusans generally come out of it looking like dicks, but I'll explain that another day perhaps. But yes, the Greeks, the Greeks are very confusing. But at least now I know where their cities are and I can keep an eye on them and make sure they've not been taken over. And I've also split up the fleets a little bit so I can actually start having them pull double duties here. Because there's a very important army here that's never actually going to do any fighting whatsoever. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, as we have mysterious cavalry heading towards our allies by both land and by sea, and a mysterious army with an entirely different function sitting in our own territory, I think we will pick this up next week and I will explain to you my grand master plan. But oh, it's lovely to be playing Total War again. I love from Total War so much. It's just one of my favourite games of all time, and I feel immensely relaxed to be playing it today. Oh, it's a privilege to play Rome Total War. It's just absolutely wonderful. So, we will pick this up. This is the new strategy series. That means this comes out every Tuesday and Thursday. And after today, it will just be an extra video. So, you'll always get two videos on Tuesday and Thursday as well. Isn't that just flipping lovely? So, we will pick this up on Thursday, ladies and gentlemen. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And welcome back to Rome Total War because this is just one of the greatest games ever created. Thank you very much and goodbye. Has he got nipple tassels on? There is nothing less intimidating than a fat bloke with nipple tassels. I wouldn't kill him. We're standing on top of a pool of oil and he's holding a torch. I'm fighting the same guy three times at the moment. It is actually the same bloke. It's cocking Scotland, not the waste beyond the wall. This isn't Game of Thrones, it's just Britain.